Okay, just remember to record. Okay, so uh, I have been teaching Excel, programming in Excel at the, at the college level, university level since 2001. That's crazy to me to say I've been teaching this class that long. At the time, there was only one uh, collegiate textbook and really for a long time, there was just one uh, to choose from. And it was like collegiate textbooks. It was expensive. It was like 150 bucks. And it was, it was a good enough book, but there was nothing special about it. In 2016, 2016, maybe 2016, I thought, you know what? It'd be great if I can find another textbook. And I thought, I wonder if I can find someone who had a textbook that's out of print that they could get the copyright to and I could go take it and put it onto my educator, which is what we did. I found this book. Matthew Harris uh, used to teach uh, Introduction to Programming at uh, Berkeley, UC Berkeley. Uh, and he wrote this book, it reviewed really, really well. It was Excel uh, 2000, you know, so it was, it was a long time ago now. Anyway, in 2016, I, I reached, it's a little while to find him, but I reached out to him, I said, listen, wouldn't you really love to bring that book up to modern standards and publish it for, for college students? And he was like thrilled with the opportunity. Uh, you'll notice this one, Teach Yourself uh, Excel Programming in 21 Days. Can you guess how many chapters there are in a book like this? There's 21 chapters. He said, listen, my only, you know, my only um, condition is don't limit me to 21 chapters. I said, look, knock yourself out. You know, I'd put them together with my educator and said, I'm sure they'd love, you know, whatever. And uh, so, so he did. He actually went back to uh, whoever owns the copyright here. He got the copyright back to his book and uh, worked with my educator to get it published and kind of brought up the 2016 standards. And the truth is he hasn't updated there. So there's some things in it that are getting a little bit dated. But this book in print at 21 chapters was 1500 pages. He produced 41 chapters. And so, uh, you know, and he did this, you know, for me to be able to teach with it here. And so, you know, I told my guys at my educator, I said, all right, hey, I'm ready. I'm excited to use this new book. And they said, this is our largest book. We don't have any other book that's anywhere close to this. It's going to be more than the normal price. And I said, how much more? They said like 20 bucks more. And I was like, you know what? We don't need the whole thing. Carve off half of it and sell it at the normal price. And they said, okay. And then it was like too much work to carve off half of it. And so they ended up selling the whole, the whole thing for the normal price. So um, uh, hopefully you saw the link. There's a link in the, uh, on the syllabus on, or kind of both in the syllabus and my textbook, whatever. So just go and get the book. It's $69. The big reason, the whole reason I want to do this push here is because on the My Educator platform, it's going to give us the ability to allow you to do your homework and projects and submit them and get instant feedback. Here, we've known for decades in um, like theory of teaching that the, one of the best things we can do to improve student learning is to reduce to shorten the feedback cycle. Um, have you had assignments where like you turn the assignment in and by the time you get it back, you've, you've moved on and you go, I guess I got, you know, 82% on that. Well, whatever. Have you, have you had that experience? Yeah, that's kind of the normal experience for me. I remember like writing structured query language queries as a student on paper and turning them in to get them graded. Uh, so now what we've done is we've, we've, we've made that feedback cycle a matter of seconds. So you'll submit it and in less than, than, than 30 seconds, you'll have your score about how you did. Other thing we know is that if we can get you to engage that feedback and um, go through and really, really learn from it, that um, that's, that's the important part, like going through and looking at the feedback. I mean, you've got the score and you went, that's the score I got. You didn't even look at the feedback. Yeah, that happened to me all the time. So here's what we're gonna do for all the assignments, both for the projects, which is really a big part of your grade and the homework, which is a small part of your grade, I'm gonna give you two submissions. And that's what the My Educator platform is, is really making possible for us. So you'll write your code, you'll submit it. It'll say, hey, you know, you got, you got 82%. Here's exactly what you're missing. You'll be able to go digest that feedback and go make another submission. And you will get the highest of those first two submissions. So you can um, submit as many times as you want but your grade is determined by the highest of your first two submissions. The idea is if you don't get 100% after your first two submissions and you'd still like to work on it for your own edification, great. But it's not gonna affect your grade. First two submissions affect your grade, that's important. I always have some students, oh, you know what? It let me submit it 12 times and so I thought I would get the highest of the 12. No, you get the highest of your first, say it with me. I get the highest of the first two submissions, okay. Uh, anyway, so that's a textbook. I'm really thrilled to be able to have this textbook. It is um, dramatically less expensive than the one I used to 
work with, and it's really a pretty good book. Remote. It doesn't seem to be working remotely. There we go. Okay, here's my teaching philosophy. I take it from Galileo. You cannot teach anybody anything. Ah, that's my philosophy. Uh, you can only help them discover it within themselves. Is that what it says? You want to have my yeah. Um, now, I really believe the first part of that. Do I really believe I'm going to help you discover VBA within yourselves? No, I don't believe that part of it. Um, but here's the point. If you can't, and I always I had once I had one student request this this semester. I always have a, you know, a student or two uh, request, hey, I'd really love to audit this course. And what do I do when they say I want to audit the course? I send them the code to audit the course. And I tell them, if you audit the course, you won't learn anything. Because what it really takes to learn that there are some classes that you can, you can really learn the content by engaging in the discussion. This is like philosophy. You go to the philosophy department and you'll be talking about, you know, having these deep discussions about ontology and epistemology and metaphysics and kind of having discussions where you learn it. That's not this class. You learn this class by doing it, right? And so without the pressure of the, of, of the assignments, why am I talking about auditing? Oh, it's, it's because of, uh, you know, that you're actually kind of doing the work that you're going to, uh, that's where you're gonna learn this stuff. So my one auditing student, if you decided to audit, I'm, I'm fine to have you here and learning it. Um, and maybe you'll have a different experience than other students had in the past. Oh, when I was in third grade, Mrs. Ransom brought into the class uh, incubator. Uh, with chicken eggs in it, fertile chicken eggs. Did you ever have this experience in grade school? Hatching, some of you did this? And we watched every day, we looked to see, you know, took the lid off and we looked to see, are these chickens hatching yet? And it takes like forever. How long did it take for a chicken to hatch? Weeks. And uh, then, oh, the excitement, can you imagine the excitement in our third grade class when we saw, we opened it up in the morning and we saw a few beaks kind of pecking through the eggs, ooh, it was pandemonium. What did we third graders want to do? We wanted to help those so poor chicks are so struggling to do this. I mean, we could help them. Could we break that egg? Sure, we could. Now, Mrs. Ransom probably wasn't entirely truthful on this. I'm really not even sure if this is true, but she said, you can't help them do that because they, you can't help them out because they are developing their muscles by breaking out of that shell. And if you open that shell for them, they will die. I don't know if that was really true, but that's what she told us. Uh, and that, that's exactly what le learning VBA looks like. It's not a pretty picture. Um, if, if, you know, anytime you have a problem, like you're coming to TA and TA, oh, here's how you do that. How do I do this? Here's how you do it. You do not, you don't learn it, right? The struggle is a really important part of learning this material. Okay, so, so th there'll be times in this class when you think, wow, this is really hard. And that's when you're gonna remember, you know, the chickens from Mrs. Ransom's class. And so this is the important part of you developing your muscles. And it's not gonna feel like developing muscles. It's gonna feel more like hitting your head against the wall. Uh, but it's a really, really important part of the process. So don't, so, so when you come to me and you say, professor, I've spent the three hours on this. I just can't get it. And I start kind of asking you questions and saying, well, have you thought about something like this? I don't just tell you the answer. That'll be frustrating to you, but that's me trying to help you really to get this stuff, right? Ah, oh. so uh, that's, that's important. We'll talk, I guess, I'm gonna go through some things in the syllabus here in just a minute. We'll talk a bit more about homework and, and projects as well. Uh, but while I have you here, uh, I wanna talk about life mission. Here I was, it was in this very building. It was not this room, it was a case room, 70 seat case room in the 1990s, early 1990s when I was a student here in the accounting. If you're an accounting student, raise your hand. Where are my accountants out there? I was one of you, whoever it was in the um, junior core. It was actually the first year that they had the, uh, the integrated junior core. I was part of that experiment. And, uh, and I had this kind of strange epiphany in class. I realized, you know, I'm a junior in college now. By the time I realized, oh, I get it. Like the stuff I'm learning here, people are gonna pay me more money because I know the stuff that I'm learning here. It took me till I was a junior, probably through my junior year to understand that part about collegiate, collegiate education. But that was only part of the way there. Um, what I, I want you to think about your education here, in a, I'm going to encourage you to think about it in a little bit different terms than maybe you have so far. So, um, you know, how many were saying, you know, I'm here to get the education I need for my career? That, probably a bunch of you here as a professional school. How many were saying, no, no, no I'm, I'm here for the education, you know, that's just, you know, to be an educated person, career, whatever, 
so some of you are here like that, okay. Um, and, you know, and, and for a long time, that's what university education was everywhere. It, it wasn't job training. Job training in the world of university, job training is kind of a new, is kind of a new thing. But I want you to think about the education you need like for your life, but specifically from what John Pingree was talking about in 2017 at the October General Conference, uh, when he talked about um, finding out what your divine mission was. It was actually just Sunday school just yesterday that we talked about Moses chapter one. Moses chapter one, um, you know, God you know, kind of shows him, uh, introduces himself to Moses, you know, and they, 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 they talk face to face. And before that, he shows him everything, you know, all the works of his hand. Well, not all the works of his hands, but a bunch of the works of his hands. He was like, I got all this great stuff. I'm pretty good at this. And, uh, and then what is he, when he introduces to Moses, what does he say? Moses, the title of the talk. He said, Moses, I have a work for thee. Even though I can do all this great stuff, there's something that I need from you. I, I, I need you to do something for me. And what Pendry said in 2017 was he said that, that that didn't just apply to Moses. That was to every single one of us who came here, that God has a work for us to do. Now, we are in this, in this culture, we are used to thinking about what does God want me to do in my calling? I'm Sunday school president. What does God want me to do? Uh, for what does God want me to do for my ministering? We're used to thinking about that. But for the first time over the pulpit, I heard him, uh, someone say, beyond that, God wants you to do something in the world for good beyond your religious requirement. He talked about several examples. For example, to give you an idea, he said he got a friend who's a doctor who really felt that it was his mission from God to serve people with what he had learned, his, what he'd been blessed with in terms of his medical learning. So what did he do? He set up a free clinic, and one day out of the week, he would work in this free clinic. And he thought that was me making the world a better place, doing what God had sent him here to do. Now, this, this talk, many of you probably heard this talk and it didn't catch you the way that it caught me because I've been thinking about this question for decades. What is it that God wants me to do in the world? And what was so fascinating about this is that for the first time, I understood how do you figure out what is your mission from God? What is your divine mission here on the earth? Because I've been, I've been thinking about it a long time. How do I go about finding out what that is? Now, what I'm trying to say, the connection I'm trying to make here is that you need the education. Do you need an education? The education you need for your career? Yes. I'm going to say, listen, you should be seeking after the education that you need to fulfill your divine purpose. To, to fulfill your divine mission. What is it that God wants you to accomplish? Find that out. Get that education and do it. And what Pingree said was he told me how to find what your mission is. I've been struggling with this for a couple of decades and he gave me the answer. And when he said the answer, I thought, that is so obvious. Why didn't I ever think about that before? What did he say? He said, Doctrine and Covenant section 46. Doctrine and Covenant section 46 talks about spiritual gifts. Some interesting things we learned in Doctrine and Covenant section 46. Number one, we learn there's a lot of different spiritual gifts. Number two, nobody has them all. No one gets them all. You know, some pretty gifted people, they don't have them all. And everyone has at least one. Unto everyone is given a gift, we learn in section um, 46. Now, here's the question. Why did God give you a spiritual gift? Someone tell me the answer to this. Why did God give you a spiritual gift? Just for fun? Go ahead, JT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not for you. It's to bless other folks. That's another way of saying he gave you that gift so you could fulfill the mission that he's given you here on the earth. That's the reason he, he didn't send you here with some mission that you couldn't accomplish. Well, this is unusual. This is not something everyone could do. This is for you. And I'm going to prepare you by giving you the spiritual gifts that you need. Will you have to develop these gifts? Yes. And so the, the, the epiphany for me here that was life-changing was to find out, to begin to find out what is it that God wants you to do on the earth? Start by trying to understand what your gifts are your spiritual gifts are. What is it that you have a kind of a, a, a kind of a natural ability to do this? That's, that, that, that you look around, you see it. Not everyone has this, this ability. Um, and that's a clue because God gave that to you to help you accomplish what he sent you here to do. So I want you to think about your education in terms of not just what I need to be able to provide for the family, but more broadly, what do I need to learn here to be able to uh, accomplish the work that God has given me? 
And if that means, I mean, you're, you may have an opportunity here. Just for a bunch of you, it's probably your last semester. But is there a class that you could take here that doesn't, you don't have to have to graduate, that you don't have to, um, you know, it's not knowledge you need for your career, but you think, you know what, this might be important for my mission. Can I take the opportunity to get that, uh, to get that now? Oh, okay. Probably won't talk deeply about that uh, anymore. That's not much DBA, but that's kind of part of what I want to do with this class. Questions? Yes. 46, section 46, spiritual gifts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, in fact, he said, it, it, it's so tempting to think, well, I don't have any spiritual gifts. No, no, everyone has at least one. And I remember from the talk, he said, there was one sister who just was certain she didn't have any until she realized she was really good at listening. You know, and do people need to be heard? Is that something that, that some people need? Yeah. And so the way that she began to, to fulfill her divine role was to seek out opportunities to hear the people that need to be heard. Um, where will your mission be? Will it be somewhere in um, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, healing the sick? Um, Kind of, these are kind of large scale things that you think maybe that's 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 somewhere that that I resonate. With. Ah, <laughs> the robe. For many of you, this is oh, you know, I don't even know if the audio is going to work. This is the first class you've had with me. Is that me? Let's see if that's any better. Uh, but how many of you have seen me wearing the robe around campus uh, before on a day like not graduation day? Yeah. Uh, it turns out that when I got my doctorate in 2001, uh, they sent me a little thing. Hey, you're coming to graduation. Do you want to rent your robe or do you want to buy it? And I thought, I'm going to have to wear this thing every uh, couple of times a year for my career. Uh, probably should go ahead and buy it. And that's when I found out that it cost more than $600. It is by far the most expensive article of clothing I own. Nothing else even comes close. Like my next, my next close thing is like a suit, but that's like two pieces. It's like I'm not even close. <clears throat> and uh, my first professorship was at Tulane University in New Orleans. We held our graduation in the Superdome, the largest building in North America. That's where we held our graduation. It was great. And the first year, I was fascinated. All the pageantry, and they had you know like jazz bands and singers and whatever, and. And uh, I was dismayed to find out the second year, it was exactly the same. The whole thing is scripted, except for the commencement speaker. Different commencement speaker, but everything else was exactly the same. Ah, oh, we get commencement speakers out here. Who are the commencement speakers we get? We had like prophets and apostles. Who did we have? One year we had Ellen DeGeneres was our commencement speaker there at Tulane, a little different culture there. Anyway, so here I am. I think after Ellen was done talking, um, and then I kind of realized, oh wow, the rest of this is exactly the same. Uh, you know, this former accounting major, um, this is before the days of cell phones, didn't have a cell phone, it's 2001, I didn't have a cell phone. You know, when you guys graduate, you watch us, we're there, on, we're, we're up there on the stand, but we've got our phones down, we learned it from you, by the way, hold it down low, look, head, hold your head up, but look down, no one will know what you're doing. And, uh, but back then, what did you do to occupy yourself while, um, while thousands of people are kind of going through this process? Did we actually give diplomas there? I don't remember if we actually went through a diploma granting thing. There was a lot of people. Um, well, what this former accounting major did was uh, I built an amortization table for my robe in my head. Accountants are, you know, anyway. And, and I came to this realization. It cost me $37.50 every time I put the thing on. I thought, that's a lot, because that's when I realized it was less to rent. I could rent every year and been better off. It would have cost me less. Ah, and I had a realization. Maybe not as great as epiphany as I had before, but I had a realization that if I wore it twice as often, it would cost me half as much per donning. And that's when I thought, I'm going to wear it the first day of class every semester, and that'll, that'll do it. So I did that for the rest of my time at Tulane. Then came Hurricane Katrina, our house got flooded, we got out of there. And I was thrilled that there was a position just open here at BYU, that's where I wanted to be in the first place. Uh, so we came here and I faced the robe question again, should I wear the robe here? Because people, when it's not graduation and people look at the robe, walking around campus, they think, 
10 years is a really bad idea because that guy has no idea what's going on. And that's what they think. The first day of the semester, he's wearing his robe. So I said, okay, I'm gonna wear the robe. Now, this is before we had the addition on the Tanner building. So we had a lot of classes that were like all over campus. So I'm walking across campus on the first day of the semester in my robe, getting the looks, wondering maybe I shouldn't have done it. Uh, so it was just the first day of class. I thought, you know, I can get by with it. Second day of class, and I came, I'm getting ready for class. And, you know, the students are there. We haven't started yet. And there's someone right on the front row. And, um, you know, I'm just wearing like a suit. And uh, the student said, Professor Allen, where's the robe? And I said, I was just going to wear it the first day. And he goes, oh, I, uh, I liked the robe. <laughs> and I said, really? I like the robe too. And I pulled the class that day. I said, how many think I should wear the robe every day? It was unanimous. You should wear the robe. I've worn the robe every day to teach since then. Uh, and I, I'm, pl I'm pleased to report, I am now well below 60 cents per donning uh, <laughs> with the robe. So it's getting a little threadbare. I hope it makes it. You know, I might have to retire early uh, to be able to uh, uh, make it go. Anyway, Hugh Nibley talked about the robe. I'm pretty sure I don't have the sound hooked up right here uh, to do this. Ah, this is from 83, it was about 20 years. Sometime in the, in the early 60s, Hugh Nibley gives a prayer at commencement where he says, you know, something like, you know, most holy father, uh, you know, we, we come, we thy humble servants, uh, you know, come before thee today, you know, and, and um, it's kind of a flowery prayer, pray, prayer, <laughs> prayer. Anyway, uh, you know, please forgive us for coming before thee this day adorned in the black robes of the false priesthood. Says this in the prayer. And, you know, after the prayer, did he, what did he, did he say what, I, what, what was that? And anyway, so he's 20 years later, he's given the commencement speech and he's talking about that. He said, you know, <clears throat> since then, many people have asked me if I really said such a thing, but he said, no one had ever asked what it meant. And he kind of goes on to talk about what it meant. I guess they're, um, apparently their origin is like apostate temple robes. Um, that's kind of where they, where they came from. So um, anyway, I always feel like I'm a little bit of a rebel wearing the robes of the false priesthood over here at uh, school. Anyway, so uh, that's the robe. Let's see if I, can I think that's it. Okay. Questions kind of on this introductory stuff. I'm not looking at you, so you'll have to like speak up if you have questions. Okay, uh, let's take a look at the syllabus. A couple of things I wanna highlight on the syllabus. Oh, first of all, do I have any TAs here? We got a bunch of TAs for this class. I just can't remember who they are. So I hope they make, I hope they let me know before too long. I'm gonna introduce you to them. They're gonna hold office hours. Um, I was gonna introduce them now, but maybe they will have some here on Wednesday. Uh, Matt, I just put him on. He's my head TA. He's been doing it for me for years. And uh, anyway, so we got others coming. I'm looking for course information. Okay, so there's going to be a Slack channel set up. A bunch of you have already joined the Slack channel. Uh, the link to the Slack channel is like in the schedule. If, I, if there's something I want you to know about, I'm going to put a link to it in the schedule on Learning Suite. That's going to be like the main place that we drive the course. Uh, and there's also going to be this help queue. Let me show you how this help queue works. Is this? Oh, it looks like it might even work here. Okay, so the IS 520, the MBA 614 actually links to exactly the same place. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you put your stuff in at 520 or 614, it goes to the same place. Uh, we will have the um, office hours built in here. I'm not sure these are the ones for this semester yet. Um, so don't. Don't, don't um, like adjust your schedule for those office hours yet. So this will show you kind of what the current requests are down here in blue. No one's waiting to be helped at this very moment. That's pretty good since it's like the first moments of class. Um, but then you'll come in here and you'll say, ah, I would like to, to get some help. So we used to actually have like physical office hours that you know, TAs would sit in an office for you to come and talk to them. Uh, and then with COVID, we couldn't do that. And it turns out this works so well that even though we probably could still do it face to face, um, we're gonna do it all virtually here. So you'll put in your net ID and that will let us know that you're authorized in this class to be able to make a request. Uh, you'll put kind of a category, what project are you working on here? And you'll brief description of your issue and you are gonna put in a Zoom link here. 
So instead of you joining onto their Zoom meeting, you're gonna set up a Zoom meeting and they're gonna join onto your Zoom meeting. Uh, and then if you wanna put something and, and all this stuff kind of up here, not your name, but like the category, um, what your issue is, those things are gonna show up here in the queue. Other people will be able to see those. But if you wanna put something that you know, is like not public, that's what the private note is. And that might be something like, hey, if my Zoom meeting closes, you know, call me on this number and we'll connect it at the end or text me or something. So you can put some kind of note there. Uh, when that happens, so these TAs, you know, like during their office hours, they're watching the queue. Uh, and the truth is, I'm going to leave myself on call. This is me, one on call. What does on call mean? On call means that when you submit this, I will get a text message that says you're looking for help. So, um, you know, even if there's no TA on duty and you're thinking, oh, you know, I'm, this is important enough for me, I'm going to reach out to Professor Allen, then you know, feel free to go ahead and submit that. I mean, I'm, I'm leaving myself on call so that I can help you in your hour of need. Um, but you should know that I usually retire to bed pretty early. Like, this will sound strange, like 8.30 is not uncommon for me to be out. Uh, the flip side of that is I'm often up at 2.30 or 3 o'clock. I'm a morning, definitely a morning person. Um, you know, and, and, and often, often into the office by 4 a.m. It's just a different schedule. Um, so yeah, I don't know if the robe does that. Don't wear the robe, who knows what it might do to you. Um, so uh, you know, if you're a morning person too, I'm a morning person, you can reach out to me in the morning. And um, yeah, so, um, but I don't even take my phone upstairs with me when I go to bed, it's downstairs. I won't hear it ring if you're thinking, I gotta get through to them, it's not gonna happen because it's where I won't be able to hear it. Okay, any questions on this help queue? All right. Uh, and the, the TAs are fantastic in terms of being able to, to give help that way and, and uh, uh, reach out to you. You can share your screen. They can help you with your code. It works so much better than when we used to have you try to come in. Uh, okay, we talked about the book, uh, grade scale. Wow. Okay, let me tell you about grades real quick. So um, you're kind of, a normal, kind of a normal grade scale in this class. Last semester, the grades were like crazy low. I don't know why the grades were so low. They were really low. Now it turns out the dean's office tells me what I'm not allowed to go above. You see, all right, you know, this is a master's level class. You're, you're not supposed to have a GPA of higher than 3.6, you know, kind of average across the class. And I'm a little offended by that because how do they know how good you are? They say I have to enforce that. And, and so, okay. But then the flip side for me as well, if that's the case, then I'm not gonna go substantially below that either. And so what I'll do always at the end of the semester, they'll say, okay, where did the grades come out? Just according to how we did it. And what would I, what would I do if your grades came out above 3.6? Would I scale you back? No. If you get above 3.6 as a whole, that's on me. You know, will it be uncomfortable? Yes. Someone from the dean's office will pay a personal visit to my office and they will tell me to cut it out. And I will say, I will do my best. But in my mind, what will I really be thinking? I have tenure. That's what I'll do. Really <laughs> but, but I am, you know, I, I'm trying to comply with university policy and so forth. Um, so, um, uh, but then if it ends up below, if it ends up below, which is what I'm, I expect will happen, is that I'll be like, all right, give everyone 100 points and let's see where we end up. Let's give everyone another 50 points and just kind of do a linear shift and uh, bring folks up, which what it means is that normally if you're close to the next grade, you'll get the next grade. Um, this, this past semester, if you were close to the next grade, you got the next grade and another grade. Um, that had never happened before. I'm not sure what happened, uh, but that's where we were. So um, if, you, if you end up thinking, oh my gosh, look at how poorly I'm doing here. Um, that's, it's not set in stone and, you know, there, things come up. And in fact, I think I said linearly and typically, typically not linearly, it turns out there are some students that really struggle with this content. And so, you know, I always have a few students that are down in the C minus and the D range just by the raw thing. Now, if you're in the C minus and D range because you like checked out of class and quit submitting homework, that's your grade. If you're in this kind of C minus range, and it's like, you know, you're, you've really been struggling with the content, and, but you've really been trying, and you can, I can look and see you've really been working at this. 
I usually, I usually compress the lower end of the distribution and bring it up a little more than the rest. So uh, if you're in that situation, come and talk to me, work with the TAs, really work through it. Don't give up on the class. Uh, we'll get you through the class. All right. Uh, grading policy, teach, my, my, my longer teaching philosophy here. Okay, homework and projects I wanted to talk about. So here's the idea on homework. The homework assignments are meant to, uh, to help you to engage, to engage the book. So um, they will be due on the day that we first talk about a concept. So if, if we have a homework assignment on loops, then it will be due on the day in class that we first talk about loops. Um, and my, my hope is you know, the best way that you can learn in this class is to say, all right, we're talking about loops on that day. I'm gonna read the chapter that he says is the part that's gonna help you with loops. And uh, I'm gonna do my best to do this homework. If I can get it figured out, great, I'll submit it, you know, at least once before class uh, even comes. Um, and that way you engage the material so that when we talk about it, you are, you are, you are prepared to receive the message. Right? You've engaged this enough that, that now when we talk about it, it's not the first time you've been it, you're ready to ask questions. That's the best thing you can do for your learning. Um, but you're going to have the time between when we talk about it in class and midnight that night, that if you say, you know what, I'm going to do this homework after he tells me how to do the homework, you're not going to learn as much and you probably will be able to get the homework done. That's up to you. I'm kind of letting you be the judge about how you want to kind of spend your time and, and, and learn this material. But it seems a little bit weird to say we're going to cover it for the first time in class and it's due that night. It's because I'm expecting you to actually do that before class. If you, if you kind of struggle with it and you think, well, man, I'm not getting this one all the way, you're still prepared for class. Come, we'll talk about it. You can ask a question and then you'll be ready to finish it off and get it done before it's due. Homework assignments, I am thrilled to have you work together, especially if you're working before class. So, hey, let's get together in groups of two or three people and say, hey, all right, let's see if we can hammer out through this and figure it out and let's talk about it. And let's, let's discuss even the code. What are we going to write? And as long as your fingers are typing your solution, that's okay. <sighs> Technically, according to what I just said, if like your partner is there who's got it working and shows you his or her result and you type in his or her result, that's still technically okay. It's not the best learning experience, but if you're working with someone and you're typing the answer, you got it. That's different than projects. There are six projects during the semester. The projects are, uh, the homework is where you prepare your mind to engage the content. The projects are where you show me that you have learned what I've been trying to teach you. Projects, you're, I'm still allowing you to work with each other on projects, but what you're not allowed to do on projects is share code in any way. You can't look at someone else's code. You can't show your code to someone else. You can talk with them. You can talk with, your, with you, someone you're working with about, you know, here's the approach that I took. I, you know, kind of said, let's, let's do this and then do this and then do this, but we're not going all the way down to the level of code. That's going to be kind of a little fine line that you have to walk um, because you're used to working together on the homework saying, hey, let's share some code. But for the projects, it's got to be your own work. <sighs> There's only three people you can turn to to actually say, let me help me with my code. Uh, and that is number one, the TAs, um, talk to the TAs and they can look at your code and say, here's where I'll help you. Uh, number two, come to me, I can help you with that. And number three is God, um, go to God on this. And you know, I, I'm not joking about this. So I'm saying, you know, spend some time in prayer and uh, you know, hopefully it's not like the last minute kind of prayer where it's like, this is due in 10 minutes, God, you know, please come through for me. Um, because uh, this will happen for about half of you here in class this semester. You will dream solutions to the projects that you're working on. Uh, and so um, I, I firmly believe that we can help that along by engaging the Almighty in sincere requests. Okay. Uh, any, maybe some of you here experienced program. Have you had that experience where you dreamed a solution? Like you woke up and it was like, ah, now I know. Yeah. So some of you have had that already. Okay. Uh, assignments. So that's the difference between homework and projects. Assignments. I got all the assignments. There's a bunch of university policies here, which the truth is they come in automatically. I don't think I've ever read them. Um, honor code, academic honesty, Title IX, all this stuff. Okay. Uh, what else do we got going on in the schedule on today? All right. Really important. 
this class assumes that you are working in a version of Microsoft Excel running on Windows. Uh, a bunch of the things that we're gonna do in this class simply cannot be done on the Mac. Does Microsoft keep the Mac version of Excel just a little bit less capable than the Windows version on purpose? I don't know if they do it on purpose, but they definitely do it. Uh, and so, you know, some of the great and powerful things that we're gonna do in this class is like, you know what, this is only available on Windows. Now, um, for many of the things that we're doing, including even submitting the assignments, your Mac is gonna work for you. And in fact, I think this semester, I'm gonna dust off my Mac and actually try to do all the assignments ahead of time on the Mac so I can kind of warn you where the pitfalls are if you're gonna try that. But there will be some times that you need to get to a Windows computer to be able to do the projects. Mm. I'm not sure that's true for any of the homework assignments, but definitely for at least, um, at least a couple of the projects are that way. So um, it used to be that we um, had some kind of agreement with Microsoft where we could give you a copy of Windows. So you could like get parallels or even a free one called VirtualBox. You could kind of do it all for free. And the options for us to give you Windows now are gone. I'm not sure where they went. So that means either buy Windows so you can install it on your Mac or borrow a PC or get to a lab computer somewhere on those times where you can't do it on on that i said i said get to a lab and that was a little screech is that what that was find it go to the library and actually use a computer in the library public library yeah okay so so if you just try to every day come along and follow along with your mac there will be days when it's like sorry mac users sit back and watch i hope you brought popcorn but your fingers will be good for nothing else um during the, the lab today. Uh, but, but mostly how this class will be work, working is that we'll be talking about something and we'll be doing stuff right here in class. So you've got a computer to bring to code along, that would be great. All right, questions on the administrative stuff. Slack, Windows, ah. Okay, so there's a little video here on getting set up for the assignments. So um, let's just kind of go through this. If you want to do this along with me now, you can. So what we're going to need to do is, is there's an add-in that we're going to have to install uh, to help us be able to get these assignments graded. And it's right, the link, the direct link to it is right there on Learning Suite. I'm going to go through that process of installing that right now, just on this computer. I'm going to download this file. Atlas VBA one underscore five, version 1.5. And where did I put that? I think that went on my downloads folder. I'm gonna remember where, I, where that went. And I'm gonna go ahead and open up Excel. Uh, apparently their privacy options have changed. You now the little bit of privacy you used to have, you don't have that even anymore, so thank you. Okay, so I've got Excel open. Uh, this will work on Mac or Windows. Ooh, how do we do it on Mac? I think, well, I think you go to the, there's like an Excel menu at the very top. Anyway, I think it's like, I don't know. We might, if you'd like, then one of you can bring your Mac up and we can try to figure it out to show how to do it on the Mac. Okay, so I'm choosing the file menu and then I'm coming to options. And your options may be lower. This is actually a 2019 version that they haven't updated yet. So I'm coming to options, but it should be mostly the same. I'll come to add-ins right here add-ins on the options. And then down here is manage Excel add-ins. I'm gonna click on go. And there is a video for this in like on the, on day one of the syllabus. So here are some add-ins that are kind of come, you know, kind of pre-ready to go with Excel. I'm not using any of those. I'm gonna browse for the one I just downloaded. So I'm gonna browse, I'm gonna go find my downloads and the Atlas VBA 1.5, I will say, okay. Make sure that it's checked. I'll say okay again. And that should give me a new tab up here called Atlas, which will give me the tools I need to be able to see the instructions and submit my homework. Questions? Stretch? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, how do we make this so that, that it's there every time? And the answer is, the way add-ins work, what we've just done should make it there every time. 
Uh, I have noticed on my machine, which I, I will actually use this in my office two or three times this semester. And I don't know what's happened in the intervening times, but I almost have to install it almost every time I went, to, I went go to use it. So it should be there, but if it's not, just go through that process again. Other questions? Ah, okay. Um, we've got a homework assignment coming up. Maybe next time we'll, we'll kind of come with this installed and maybe we'll go through and actually do the next homework assignment together in class so you can see the whole flow for it. All right, so the content that I want to cover today from chapters one and three of the book, speaking of the book, if there's any, if there are kind of any criticism of the book, it's that the guy is a little bit wordy. I remember when I was a student, um, there, were, there were very few tasks in my daily schedule that I looked forward to less than reading a textbook. Now, part of that was that I was reading accounting textbooks. Um, a textbook in some sense is a textbook. The truth is you'll get more out of this if you read the textbook kind of before class. In my heart of hearts, I don't think you're gonna do that. Uh, and so, you know, I will be, you know, kind of covering the things from the book that I think are most important, the things that are gonna show up on uh, the exams or stuff that we're gonna cover in class. And now I wonder why I said that. I was, I was on the way somewhere else with that. Chapters one, it's probably as I was talking about chapters one and three. So yeah, if you haven't read chapters one and three, that's okay. Um, you might want to go ahead and read them still, but that's good. Yeah, when it's asking for your university identifier, I want your net ID. Yeah, if you've, if you've already put in your student ID, the, the digit, the, the numeric one that's on your card, there's a way through settings in my educator to go and update that. I cannot update it for you. You have to update it. So yeah, it should be your net ID, thanks. Yeah, and that's gonna be important because that's what's gonna let your scores that happen on my educator flow into learning suite, which is where your grade's gonna be calculated. By the way, the grader is really great at giving 100%. Like if you did everything that we're looking for, full credit. Uh, it is not so good at finding out that you did something really small that makes your code do everything wrong. If you do something small, if you make some small error that makes your code do everything else wrong, what do you think? Should you get a low score or a high score? Let's vote. Who says high score? Who said no, it's a low score? Some of you, really? <laughs> okay, those who said low score, you'll get low scores. Everyone else gets high score. <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm on the high score. If you make a small mistake, I think it should be a high score, but the grader doesn't look at your code and go, ah, oh, I get it, small mistake right there. The grader always looks at the outcome. And so what you should always understand that, that, the, the, that what the grader gives you isn't necessarily your final grade. You always have the ability to go to a TA and say, listen, this is what the grader gave me. I think I'm, I think I'm more than 20% on this assignment. Um, you know, and I'm more than glad to look at that assignment for you as well and kind of go through and say, oh yeah, I agree. This is more like 82% or something and we'll roll some dice and then give you a score and whatever. Um, but it, it won't be as precise as what the grader does, but I think it will probably be a little bit more fair in, in that situation. So now there may be times when the grader can't grade your assignment at all. Like if, if um, you've done something in your code, realize that the grader is actually running in VBA and you can do, you can do stuff in VBA that just like terminates the VBA process, including the grader. In which case you're going to say, all right, let's grade this. And then boom, the whole thing's dead. It never finishes. Uh, in that case, what you're going to do is you're going to upload your workbook file to Learning Suite. So all the, all the assignments in Learning Suite have a place for you to upload. That's not normally how you get your grade. Normally, you submit right there from the workbook, and you'll get your grade on My Educator. But the way that you say to the TA, please look at this because I couldn't submit it, or even you know, please look at this because it, it graded low, lower than I think it should be graded, just upload it to Learning Suite and they'll go over them from time to time. And if you think it's been a while and they haven't gotten to it, send them, a, send them an email or uh, you know, hop on Zoom with them and uh, say, hey, could we look at this together? Okay, so the important thing to realize is that if the machine gives you a grade, it's not like, oh, I guess that's the grade I got. I thought I was closer. That's the starting point, okay? Questions? Yes. Oh, good question. Yeah, yeah. 
The question is, uh, what if I end up getting quarantined? Um, can I, can we, can we zoom in like during class to where we could actually ask a question or kind of meter what's going on? And the answer is yes. Uh, where is it? Where's learning suite? Do I have learning suite up here? So in learning suite, you have the online tab here. And this is going to just come here and follow that link, or I guess maybe hit the start button and uh, you can just join the meeting. I think we've got, do we have anyone joining with us now? Yeah, we've got five participants. Or I guess I'm one of them. So we've got four people that have joined today. Um, several of them were like, hey, I'm sorry, I'm quarantined. Others were like, I couldn't get back from uh, you know, where I was visiting the family. Someone else said, hey, I'm still on vacation. Any way I can participate? Uh, yeah, okay, Zoom, take me with you. Uh, yeah, so that's there. Oh, and there's one more thing. So I'm going to show you this blog. In fact, I think we're going to, I think I must have a link to it here somewhere in the schedule. Let me just see if I can point that to you. Um, files and videos for this course. This link here is going to take you just to a blog in Blogger. And here I've got the course laid out. You know, today's introduction, then we're going to do variables, and the whole semester is laid out here. Uh, but by the way, last semester is laid out here as well. Um, and so you want to see what we did on September 1st? Here's the video from class. Um, there's no files that you needed to do that. So this kind of is all here. So even if you wanted to kind of look ahead and see, am I going to do something pretty similar to what I did last semester? I've been teaching this course for 20 years. What do you think? Yeah, I think I pretty well got it figured out. Yeah. question that this student has asked is that there's this is the only time this semester that this class is offered and I got another class that's the same situation I got a conflict I really want to take them both what do you think could I just do this by video or mostly by video or partly by video turns out that the university policy prevents me from answering that question by saying yes that would be a fine way to do this class I'm, I'm not allowed to say that so far as I know there's no policy that prevents me from saying many students have done that in the past and have had a successful experience in the course. That's about as close as I can get. <laughs> All right, that whole tenure thing is, is uh, I'm feeling it today. So, uh, so here, but here's the idea, is that uh, usually within a half hour or so after class, I will have uploaded the video here, that was the video from class, uh, and whatever file that we worked on, this is, we'll normally be working on a file in class and I'll upload it there. So you'll have just what I get. From time to time after class, um, you know, someone will pull me aside, like a colleague and we'll get off busy doing something and I'll go home before realizing I haven't posted the video. In which case, slack me and say, hey, Professor Allen, I was really hoping to see that video. And uh, like, oh yeah, I forgot to post it. And I'll go, go ahead and get it posted pretty quick. So, um, you know, in a perfect world, I'll get that done straight away. Uh, maybe I can get the TAs to help to remind me on that too, to keep an eye on that as well. But usually, usually three or four times during the semester, I just forget to do it. And it's not till the next day that it gets posted. All right, other questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what if I'm late on posting it? You know, we kind of go back and look at last semesters. That's probably your next best thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any other questions before we get into the content for today? All right. Uh, so let's go ahead and open up Excel. And we've got to understand that Excel, the, the, so the language that we're using to automate Excel, of course, is VBA. I'm assuming you already knew that kind of before you came and took this class. Back in the early days of spreadsheets, so the 19th century, cast your mind back to the 1970s. Um, I know I was the only one born here in the 1970s, this class, but you know, we had the very first spreadsheets was a, was a program called VisiCalc. What did VisiCalc had? It had rows, sorry, it had rows, it had columns. You could put a formula into a cell that referenced antecedent cells. That was all it did. That was it. And it was like, whoa, you mean I can do out the whole budget and I can change 
this assumption up here and the whole budget calculates itself again all by itself? Whoa, that was serious. In fact, it was a combination of VisiCalc's successor, SuperCalc, and the Apple IIe computer that made businesses for the first time look at a personal computer, a computer that sits all by itself on a desk, not being connected to some larger computer in the next room over, that made businesses for the first time say, this might be useful to us. And budgeting was the place that it started. You know, this deal of doing budgets, that was, that was enough to do it. They cost like about $5,000 to get that set up and go, yeah, that was worth it. Wasn't long. And so, and so that's really when spreadsheets kind of come into business is the mid 1970s. It's not long after that when we realized we're doing the same thing over and over again. Like every month we do the same exact set of keystrokes. Apple IIe, what kind of mouse does the Apple IIe have? No mouse. It's kind of strange to think about an Apple computer with no mouse. It is just a keyboard. And so pretty quickly, someone said, you know, it would be great if this program would just record the keystrokes because if I could do those exact same keystrokes again, it would just do it again. And, and that was the very beginning of what we called a macro. We, today, we call those keyboard macros, just re re recording keystrokes. And in fact, when you, back in the day, uh, in fact, when I started with this in the early 90s, when you set a macro, the first thing was, what cell do you want to start your macro in? You'd pick a cell and it would just, that cell would have a keystroke. The next one down would have a keystroke. It would just be a list of keystrokes that you would play back. And, um, and that was great until the mouse. Because now that the mouse came around, now we start doing things with the mouse and it's not just the keystroke. Uh, in fact, I remember teaching uh, how to use at the time it was Quattro Pro, it was a Borland product. Um, here, when I was a student here to other students, you know, when I got to the part about macros and it was like, just to take that mouse and forget it because it's not gonna work for the macro. And that's the way it was until 1995. In 1995, Microsoft introduced a way to record a macro that instead of recording the keystrokes, it recorded the activities that those keystrokes invoked in a computer language. Now. Way back in 1995, what was the language that Microsoft was using? Anyone know? So it was, a, it was a language called Visual Basic for Applications. It was the same language that we're using today. At the time, I thought, you know, I'd probably be good, glad to get five years out of a language. In other words, learn the language, get productive with it. It'll be out of date. And you'll have to learn a new language in about five years. I learned Visual Basic for Applications in 1995 and it's still relevant today. It's like, wow, I hit the jackpot. This was a great language to learn. <clears throat> and so that's, um, that's kind of how we got to where we are. And so now when we record a macro, why is it called a macro? Macro seems like such a strange name. I still, I mean, what does macro mean? It means small, but not that small. Um, I don't know why it's called that. Um, but I've said it so many times now for decades that it seems like a normal word to describe this process. And so that's, that's the idea. One of the great things about working with Excel is that we have the macro recorder, which means that we can record ourselves, what we just talked about, we'll record ourselves and it tells us what we, what we do. If there's anything you can do in Excel that you wanna know how to do in VBA, good news, record yourself doing it and you'll get the code. Will it be the best code for doing it? No, but it'll be code that will show you how to do it. And a lot of times it'll require some modification. That'll be a big part of what we do in this course. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we have to do to uh, kind of get to the Visual Basic environment and to be able to invoke the macro recorder to do something simple here today. So you're gonna to come to the developer tab, developer tab, let's see, home, file, home, insert, um, formula, data. I don't have a developer tab. What's wrong with this thing? Well, it turns out that VBA gives you so much power that the good folks in Redmond, Washington don't want mere mortals having access to it. And so it's not there. You can't get to it unless you know the secret handshake. But you're in luck. I'm going to teach you the secret handshake today. You have to install. We don't have to install anything. You just have to enable the developer tab. Here's how you do it. Uh, you're going to come to file. You're going to come to options. Oh, it's been years since I've done this on the Mac. I think it's Excel preferences. Someone who got the Mac, try it. The Excel menu at the very top. These are preferences, preferences, and then what? Something about the ribbon, customize the ribbon. Good, so Excel, Excel preferences, customize the ribbon in, um, 
Windows, it's File, Options, and then we're going to come here to Customize Ribbon. Uh, and right over here, the Developer tab is unchecked. Just check it. While you're there, if that Home tab is too pesky, it's always bothering you, you could uncheck it. You know, We don't use that Home tab for much. Just go ahead and turn it off. You might do that. Maybe, maybe your roommate left his computer on and April Fool's Day is coming up and uh, go turn off his home ribbon. I don't know, that'd be a sin. Probably have to repent for that. But on the other hand, I do encourage repentance. So I don't know. Right, so now I'm gonna say, okay. And like magic, I got the developer tab. So this is gonna be the one that lets me invoke all the functionality we need for BBA. Ah. <sighs> Maybe we'll start off just by recording a quick macro. We'll take a look at it and we'll write some code of our own uh, for today. So let's just suppose that um, you know, we find ourselves doing something over and over again. Like we're maybe we're keeping track of uh, you know, time that we're doing on billable projects. And so you know, we always find ourselves building a little spreadsheet just to keep track of our hours. I'm not sure this is the best example. This is one that we'll be able to kind of get through pretty quickly. So you know, it's always like I come in here and I type the customer that I'm working on, the project that it's for, the date, uh, who the employee is, when it was approved, some note, uh, time, you know, time started, time stopped, or something like that. So instead of me just kind of doing that, I need to make that little chart, I'm going to make a macro for myself that does that. I'm going to zoom in here a bit. And so we're just going to get a little experience recording with the macro. So first thing to realize is that it's going to record the activities that you do. And so if I want to record selecting A1, I can't be on A1 to start. I got to be somewhere else. And I do, I want to, I want to say, all right, let's go to, I don't care where we are. Let's go to A1 and let's start putting some information in. So I'm going to get off of A1 and now I'm going to record a macro. I'm going to come here to where it says record macro. And we'll go through this example again, another class where we're really focusing on this today. We're just kind of getting going. I'm going to leave the name the way it is. I'm not going to talk about a shortcut key. I'm just going to say, okay. Now that macro recorder is on. And if I look right down here in the bottom left-hand corner, I will see that I've got the stop button. That's how I can tell I'm currently recording. In fact, here, I'm gonna do this. You guys just stay right where you are. Alt F11. I'm gonna bring over this environment. I'll show you how to get here in just a minute. And here's module one. So here's the macro that we're currently recording. Um, I'm just going to go a little bit larger here. Stand by. I love this interface. I'm about to drop this down. And you're going to have the world's smallest scroll bar right there. It's like useless. I'm going to go to MS and Serif Western. And let's go to like 20 points. Should be able, ooh, 30, that's too big. 24. All right, you should be able to see that a little bit better than here in the classroom. Okay. So this is what it's records, recording macro one. So this is watch what happens. I'm going to click on A1 and it has just recorded that activity. Now, let's take a look at what it's recorded here. It is saying range A1.select. Turns out that VBA is an object oriented language. Oh, there are some people that will argue about that. It is at least an object based language. It totally involves objects. Um, is it an object oriented language? There are some kind of characteristics of object-oriented languages that it does and some that it doesn't. Let's just call it an object-oriented language for ourselves today. So what that means is that the, the, the big deal that it works is it says, all right, we're going to be manipulating objects. There are th oh, boy. I'm going to give you a definition. Um, this is probably not a definition you need to take the notebook out for. I think you're going to get it when I describe it to you. you know, so just kind of listen. I remember when I was a student here in the 1990s, I took my very first class in object-oriented programming. I was three quarters of the way through the class before I realized I still don't really know what an object is. The class was object-oriented programming. So I'm, you're, but you're in luck. Today's the first day of the semester. I'm going to tell you what an object is. Are you ready? An object is a thing. Specifically, it's anything we can manipulate through code. It's, any, it's anything that has these two characters, characteristics that we're going to talk about. And so if we look at this code that's just recorded, it said it's talking about a thing. What thing is it talking about right here? It's a cell. Yeah, that's a thing. Now, objects have two characteristics that are really important to us. And one of them is called a method. A method 
It's just some action that the object knows how to do. And so what this line is saying, it is saying, it's giving the instruction to, to the cell in A1. It's saying, A1, go select yourself. That range, that cell knows, built into it, it has capability. It has something it knows how to do. And one of the things it knows how to do is it knows how to make itself become the active cell. And so when we are, when we're telling a cell to become active, we are, it's not like we are saying we're making a cell active and we're giving it A1 as, the, as you know, what we're acting on. No, no, no. We are giving the instruction to A1 saying, make yourself active. So that select is called a method. So what we see here is we see an object, we've identified an object over here on the left-hand side of the dot. And then on the right-hand side, we're giving it instruction. We're selecting it. Okay. So the next thing I'm gonna record is I'm gonna put in here, uh, I'll put in a label here, date, D-A-T-E. And I'll hit tab to go to the next cell over. And we can see that now it has, it has changed a property of the object. And these are the two characteristics of objects that are gonna be critically important to us. Me objects have methods. Methods is something that object knows how to do. Property is a value that describes the way the object is. And so we just changed something about the way this object looks, like we gave it a value in there. Now, the truth is, it's not really a formula, much less a formula R1C1. R1C1 means it's a different kind of notation. Instead of referring to cells by like A6, you would say row, six column one would be the way you do it. And so I don't know who wrote the macro recorder for this. That's a really bad thing to do. It happens to accomplish exactly the same thing. It'd be better if this said active cell dot value equals date. Um, and we could change it, it would do the same thing, but that's what it recorded. So, but we have changed a property. And so interesting difference between methods. Methods are themselves instructions. So, we can say object.method all by itself. Every statement, every line in VBA has to be an instruction to tell the computer to do something. And a method is an instruction. So if you look at a line, it just says like some object dot something else, and that's a valid line, that's gotta be a method because it's an instruction. Now, formula R1C1 is not a method, it's a property. And so if we just said active cell formula R1C1, it would go, I don't know what, I don't know what to do with that. But by making this into an assignment statement, the equal sign here says, I'll point with the mouse so folks in Zoom can see it. The equal sign here says, take whatever's on the right-hand side and put it in what's on the left-hand side. And so this is called an assignment. And we are putting the value D-A-T-E. The single quotes here just say, hey, this is just a collection of characters. Don't try to understand it. And it's gonna put it into that property. So we're changing the value that that property holds, which changes the way the object is. So methods, are things the object knows how to do. Properties are values that describe the way the object is. All right, so let's just go ahead and do a couple more. Uh, customer. <laughs> no. Over here. Oh, and then you can see it's selected the next cell over. And you'll see that happen over and over again. Uh, customer. Project. Uh, start. And employee. Uh, and approved. I don't know. So nothing new here, just more of the same stuff that it's going through. Questions? All right, I'm gonna now gonna come here and select this whole range and just did control shift right arrow. And this, this class assumes that you're pretty conversant with Excel. Uh, it assumes that you've never programmed anything before in your life. That's not true for many of you. Many of you have programmed somewhere else. Um, but this is, we're gearing this to the folks that are just starting here. Uh, why don't we go ahead and make that bold? This is interesting. You can kind of see this bold one down here. This one says, not just a range, but we're saying, hey, from whatever was selected, we're going to dot font. That's a property, font is a property but the font property is also an object itself. So it has properties. So the selection has a font, the font has a property called bold and we're setting that to be true. That's what made it bold. I'll change the background color of this as well. So let's see, um, home, fill color, maybe kind of a light blue in the background. Ooh, this one's a little bigger block than recorded here. So we're gonna change several things about this at once. That's what this with and with block is. It's saying, all right, 
we got an object that we're going to do a bunch of stuff with, with this object. Whatever is selected, it has an object called interior. It's all the stuff about what you see on the inside of the cell. And we are going to change the pattern of that object, the pattern color, the theme, the tint and shade, the pattern tint and shade. We'll put all these values in it. The end with says we're done working with that object. So inside a with end with block, when you see that dot, an expression that starts with a dot, uh, you're just saying, take whatever object is here after the with clause and just put it right in front. Does that make sense? Truth is, I wish we didn't, I wish it didn't record it this way, uh, but at least it makes the code not as wide. It lets you go a little bit narrower. Uh, let's, uh, you know, let's do one more just because it's hideous. Uh, I'm still selected here. I'm just gonna put a dark underline on it. So solid, let's see where's thick underline. Thick bottom border, Oop. So it, it required a lot of stuff to be able to do those borders because it's not just setting thick bottom border, it's saying, ah, we're setting the borders to this. Whatever borders were there before, were the diagonal, the, di the diagonal down border, that's line style is gonna be none. Diagonal up, none. X, uh, the, the edge left part of the border, none. And then by the way, we'll set the other borders here. So kind of a lot to bite off here, but let's go ahead and stop recording. Very important to remember to stop recording. I'll click the stop button here or on my developer tab, the button that used to be my record macro is now stop recording. I can go ahead and stop the macro recorder. Ah, oh, one day in the mid 1990s, must have been 96. I was at work. You know, I'm going to record a macro to do this. I started recording a macro. My wife called me. There was some problem with the plumbing. I ended up calling a plumber. But by the time I was done with that phone call, I forgot that I was recording a macro. And I guess forgot that I even wanted to record a macro because I worked for about the next four hours in Excel, just doing stuff in Excel. And then I went, oh, I was recording a macro. And I went and looked. It was thousands and thousands of lines long. I felt so productive. <laughs> It was utterly worthless, but it was, wow, that was the biggest macro I ever recorded. So yeah, you want to remember to stop recording. So now, let me go ahead and, and just open up a new sheet, and I could run this macro. There's several ways I can run Let's look at a couple of them. One is I can come here on my uh, developer tab. My, I can open up the list of macros here, and then I can just, there's my macro number one. I'll run it, and that will do that same just redo that same thing, just played those steps. We didn't modify those steps or anything. We just said, let it go. Uh, how else? Other way that you can get to it, even if you don't have the developer tab is on the view tab. So view, you've also got the list of macros here on the view tab. It takes you to the same place. Uh, you can run it from there. Uh, also, we can run it from inside here. Now, let me show you how to get, I'm gonna show you now how to open up this, the, the Visual Basic Editor. The way you open the Visual Basic Editor is you come to your Developer tab and you choose Visual Basic. The keystroke, as it shows right here, is Alt F11. I think that works in the Mac as well. Alt F11 is the same keystroke that will open it up. Now that will open up. It'll open up your editor looking something like this. And we can see I've got project uh, a project here called Book One. That's my book here. I've got three sheets in the workbook. Uh, you may not have that many. I have a thing called this workbook, but the one I'm after is this modules down here because a module is where any VBA code that I write that is going to stick around with a workbook has got to be in a module. And so I'm going to come here and open up the module. And so that will take me to the code. There, I can have multiple modules here. So sometimes you might have to look around for it. In fact, if you're working with someone else's code and you think, well, boy, I've got this button. If this is one button of dozens that runs something or you know the name of the macro, Here's what you can do. Um, go ahead and close this. You can come to my list of macros. And instead of running this, I can say edit. And that will open up the cancel and close this. It will actually open up the Visual Basic environment as well. So where am I? I'm on macros, edit. Not only will it open it, but it'll take me right to the right place. Okay. So big message for today is we're gonna be working with objects. Objects have two characteristics that are really, really important to us. What are those two characteristics called? One of the things an object has is a method. That's something that the object knows how to do. The other one is a property, sometimes called an attribute. We kind of use those terms attribute and property interchangeably here. 
And that's something that it does. One more thing before we, before we go, and that is when you're gonna save a workbook that has a macro in it, you have to say file save or save as, and, but you have to change the type. The default type here, XLSX, cannot have macros in it. And if you save it with XLSX and you ignore the prompt that it gives you, it will throw away the code that you have. So instead, we're gonna change this to XLSM. Now a macro enabled workbook. I'm gonna put this in my downloads and I'm gonna call it objects. O B J C T S fall, no, we are winter of 22. All right. So this, this file, there's not really much to look at in this file, but I'll go ahead and post it there anyway. But the file and the video from today will show up on the blog later today. And we're off and running, folks. I'll see you on Wednesday. Thanks for coming. Class dismissed. Yep. Last minute videos.